Good evening and welcome to the Sunderland uh, Select Board meeting. Tonight is Monday, September 14th, 2020, and we're eh, about 32, a couple minutes late, so not too bad tonight. <clears throat> so tonight on our agenda, we've got uh, some minutes. We've got a, a discussion of 40B proposal, uh, our usual COVID-19 state of emergency update. Um, I don't think we have anything new on the discussion of benchmarks for employee wages and because of uh, state information yet, but we've got that as a weekly placeholder. Uh, any select board or town administrator updates. And then we've got a discussion on 120 North Main Street. I see a couple of people there for that tonight. Um, we've got a discussion of uh, diesel and gasoline fuel bid recommendation and a recommendation for a highway laborer. And after that, we will go into executive session, um, in which case we'll adjourn the meeting here and then we will uh, end the Zoom feed and we will only come back to adjourn for the evening. So that's our lineup for this evening. Um, so first up, we've got our minutes from August 31st on there. Do we have any uh, questions or uh, motions on those? Uh, no. All second. All right. T Tom, did you first add or? I made the motion, Davey. Thank you. <laughs> all right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Hey, George. Hello. All right, um, next up, we've got our 40B proposal for 61 to 67 Old Amherst Road. And I see uh, you guys are on there. You guys look like you're, there you go, I was gonna say. Here we are. All right. <clears throat> so we'll take it away. Um, go for it. Off. Good evening, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson down in Amherst uh, here with Jason Keats. Uh, so this is maybe the third or, or fourth time I'm losing a little bit of track. Uh, being in front of you just to talk about 6167 Old Amherst Road in Sunderland. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're getting to a point, we think, where um, the project is getting refined. The, you know, the number of units, I think, are, are where they need to be. Uh, Jason has provided um, kind of some marketing highlights, so how he can prevent, because we've been talking a lot about undergraduate students and, and who are the occupants of the, the space, who's, go, who's it going to be? And so one of the best ways is through marketing. And so what Jason did was put together um, some marketing highlights. Um, and then we also submitted just an updated site plan, updated um, studio, one bedroom and two bedroom unit plan and we've got a, an exterior rendering as well and uh, the a proposed apartment layout. So, you know, at some point, in, and it's not this meeting, but it's probably next meeting, um, you know, we're going to be asking for some support from the select board as the, the highest ranking elected body in town. Uh, it's likely that we're gonna go in under the local um, initiative program, the LIP, program. And so what we would need is ultimately a letter of support from the select board, um, along with a signature on our LIP application that ends up going to uh, DHCD. And again, we're not asking for that this evening, probably the next meeting. And so I think what we'd like to do is find out what the board needs in order to feel comfortable to, to issue that letter and then to authorize Jeff to sign and then to sign themselves uh, that application. And so if that's a, a more comprehensive presentation because we've done it a little bit piecemeal so far, that's fine. If it's more writings, that's fine. But we just wanna get a little bit of guidance from you um, so that the next time you know, we're here and, and we can hopefully put it to bed. Okay. Um. Yeah, and I think probably at your final one, like a quick overview would probably be good too at that point for everybody as to where it stands, you know, at that time. Um, <clears throat> anybody have any um, questions or comments? I was going to ask if I could, Mr. Chair, if Jeff mm -hmm. wouldn't mind putting up what the, the floor plan, fascia, et cetera, looks like, facade, yep. street level the updated information that would be great 
Thanks, Chef. Just the marketing. So, Tom, could you give us the 101 on what LIP is? Sure. So it is the local initiative program. And so mm -hmm. when you don't have state or federal subsidy, you go through this program because it's been deemed to uh, be a, a type of assistance because the DHCD can give assistance. Um, and it's really technical assistance. And if I, I've already reached out to the LIP coordinator, Raiko Hayashi over at DHCD, who I've done pick a number of projects with. Um, and so it's, it's, it's kind of a joint application, I guess is a, a better way to describe it, where I think the municipality retains some more control than they otherwise would have. And so, you know, the application has, um, you know, the developer, the contractor, the architect, it has municipal players, if you will, it, it describes whatever local contributions are being made or, or would be made. Um, and it really has just a comprehensive breakdown of the number of units, the bedrooms, et cetera. And so it's, it's the program that someone in Jason's position with 29 units, not looking to have um, any subsidy, any state or federal subsidy, um, and he would look to go through that program. And what's the town's role in that, if I could, Mr. Chair? Yeah, please. Sure. So the town still has uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals would still act under the comprehensive permit. And so it, it still has the same authority that it, that it had before. Um, it really is just saying, you know, we think that this is an appropriate location for this type of affordable housing. So I don't, I don't think it, you know, we haven't talked about CPA funds. Uh, we're happy to. Um, we haven't talked about other local contributions, any tax increment financing or anything like that, which you know, might need to be a discussion. I haven't had that discussion with Jason yet. Um, but that's really, you know, when we're talking about town responsibility, it's, it's really what is the town contribution to this? And I think ostensibly it would be at least, you know, um, first and foremost, the ability to have 29 rental units at this location at 6167 Old Amherst Road, where arguably otherwise you couldn't get that density. And so it's that density bonus that, that you would get by going through this program and this process. Um, and so that is seen and could be seen as the local contribution. But we haven't talked about contribution of CPA funds. We haven't talked about tax increment financing. And so, you know, the expectation, at least right now, the expectation from the town uh, is really just a supportive role. And we're not asking for any, any action. Thank you. Do you have any, any points? I don't know if you want to add anything to this. Uh, Jeff, did you have any anything you wanted to bring up from the town administrator perspective at all? Yeah, and, and Tom, you might be able to answer this, but I mean, I think that we, we touched on it a little bit last time, but it, you know, it's a, it's a 10 acre site and you're talking about building on the existing footprint, both the former nursing home and, and the house and you know what and, and i know that that jason said there really hadn't been any thought put into what's going to happen on the rest of it um i mean i i think that there would be a higher comfort level for, from the town's perspective if we knew what was happening on the rest of the 10 acres whether that be um, conservation restriction an open space restriction a solar field so this was a net zero you know that that, that tied in directly to the electricity um, for you know understanding what the developable potential for the rest of the parcel would be I think would be helpful um, 
and I guess I would say at a minimum understanding that by granting, you know, a 40B, there's an understanding that that's not um, implicit approval to, you know, five, 10, 15 years down the line, put another 200 units there. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's, it's a good comment. Um, and I think it's one that Jason and I just really have to drill down. I think that the solar is interesting, doing a behind the meter project, right. you know, something like that, trying to, to, to get to net zero. Um, I don't know, given that it's an existing structure, retrofitting it to get to that point, I'm not sure exactly how that'll cut, but uh, loud and clear. Let me let me talk with Jason and figure out what we want to do or what we could do with the balance of that land. I saw on a couple of the floor plans. It looked like turning radiuses. Tom, are you incorporating a little bit of ADA design in a couple of units as well? Is that what I'm uh, understanding? You've got it. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes. Is it like four units or something like that, right? That's correct, yes. Thank you for that. I think it's at the bottom if you scroll up a little, Jeff, I think. Yeah, there it is. Hmm. And so there's five total units that would be accessible. Well, Mr. Chair, typically when yeah. you when you talk about a friendly four to be forty B, there's there's benefits to the town <clears throat> as well as the developer. So, right. what would be the what would what would be considered uh, favorable to the town? Why would we right right now we have met our our uh, threshold of 10% for affordable housing in town. So we have uh, an opportunity to be very selective in what, what we bring in under 40B. So why would we, what's being offered to the town to say, hey, look at this is a good thing for the town besides that it's taken a, a uh, a place that's not being used right now. What other benefits are we seeing for the town? Sure. So I, I would think that the, the one that you mentioned is the biggest one. So right now you have a property that's ostensibly zoned inappropriately um, that is not paying taxes in tax title and is, is blighted and, and probably an attractive nuisance. And so trying to find a use or a user who is willing to expend the resources to redevelop that property uh, at the cost that it's going to take, un unless they're incredible philanthropists, you're, you're gonna have a really tough time finding it, save for some affordable housing or a 40A section three use and you know an educational or religious use of, uh, uh, you know, a methadone clinic, a halfway house, or, you know, something like that. Those, I mean, I've seen them. I've seen them um, in Springfield. I've seen them in this site, frankly, probably lends itself to it, given the nursing home infrastructure that's already there, the size of the rooms, et cetera. And so I think the redevelopment of this site meaningfully is, I mean, we, we can't just say besides that, because I think that is the biggest one. And then beyond it, I don't know that just meeting the threshold, I mean, from everything I've, I've learned and I've seen in other towns with um, 40B, and I don't know the exact numbers in Sunderland, but it, it's good. But all it takes is a couple of subdivision developments to increase the year round housing units to start to mess with what that 10% where you're at with the affordable units relative to the 10%. And besides that safe harbor, it's a good thing to do on a human level is to give folks who otherwise couldn't afford a place to live in Sunderland, a place to live. Um, and so I think, you know, for those things, 
it, it's a it's ultimately a benefit to the town. But I, I can't discount the the taxes. You know, having a taxpayer, having a property being redeveloped, um, and providing additional housing, especially non-student housing. I mean, if there's something specific. Tom, that you're that you're looking for that you think the town could could gain by this we're all ears um, but we think it has some intrinsic qualities to it so if i could mr chair under the lip program uh tom attorney tom are there deed restrictions associated with this and does this count toward our affordable housing units yeah. in perpetuum I think it's something we could talk about if, if ah. the town required perpetuity. So yes, they would qualify in the subsidized housing inventory. Mm -hmm. um, most of the regulatory agreements that I've seen recently have been in perpetuity. It, mm -hmm. They're not required to be. Uh, 30 years, I think, is what you're really looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I haven't talked to Jason about it, but if that's the way that this project gets permitted is to have these units qualify in the subsidized housing inventory in perpetuity, then I think they qualify in, in, in perpetuity. I, I lean again along the same subject, in particular with the ADA units. But regardless, I'm, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in furthering that discussion at some point. Okay. Yeah, that's a, a very valid point. <clears throat> All right. And, and for, for me, Mr. Chair, um, we, we've gone, personally, I've gone to the 40B before. I, I'd like a lot of things specified and written out and on paper before I would write a letter to anybody about anything. I, I just, and again, the old adage, fool me once. Um, we've been fooled one, two, and three times by developers. And, 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 and we, may, we may have found the perfect developer, that being said, my experiences have not led me to say that um, that perfect developer would is necessarily coming through the door. So, I, and and I also, you know, I you know, you, you know, when, once you get to once you get to the zoning board of appeal, then then a whole then you know, I I think we should have some public hearings, talk to the neighbors, bring them involved, get you know, get a lot of people involved. Also, you know, just when you know something that that's going to affect a neighborhood and that will affect the affect a neighborhood um i i think people should be able to have a comment about it um and they should be actually able to see we we should put up the plans put the plans online put them in the and it's tough right now but but allow people to have an opportunity to come and ask questions uh, that we may not that we may not be bringing forward right now um, I, and again, I, I'd also like to see where the town is going to benefit from the project as much. So you put you you know you say they're affordable housing. Well, we we understand what that term means, um, and sometimes affordable housing is more expensive housing than what's presently in place. So it it's it's a, sometimes that the wording is misleading, in in my opinion, and and what we've seen. So maybe just so I'm clear, are you asking for, and through the chair, are you asking for a public hearing prior to your issuance of any letter of support, or is this something during the Zoning Board of Appeals process? That's what I'm asking. I, I'm I, again, I'm just one member. Yep. I would say I, I would say that I would I would want people to have a, a voice in it to understand um, what's happening there before all of a sudden they wake up one one morning to, to see construction vehicles over there and, and a renovation going on. Yeah, it'd be good to reach out to the community and then, you know, we could not, notify the, at least the abutters, certainly in the area. <clears throat> and then um, we could do that at your presentation. Okay. Did you have any other questions for us about specific items at all, Tom? R? No, I don't. I don't. Okay. Think, I don't think so. Oops! Hold on. I just lost my video. There we go. You're back. 
I, I accidentally, I was clicking on something and I accidentally turned off the video. Um, okay. <clears throat> so I think, um, why don't you, um, you've got a couple of takeaways there to look at and then why don't you let us know, you know, when you think would be a good time for you to, to come. And then we can discuss some um, with Jeff and everything about maybe doing like a public presentation like Tom suggested. That'd be a, a good thing because while we've talked about it, a lot of people may not even be watching this meeting at a given time, especially the people right in that immediate area. So it would be good to to get them involved just to see what's going on. <clears throat> and also give you a chance to make your elevator pitch, you know, in that respect too. <laughs> so, all right. Anybody have any other questions on um, on the topic for tonight? I'm all set, Mr. Chair. All right. Okay. All right. And thanks. Uh, thanks for coming again, Tom and okay. Jason. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. See you later. Thanks. All right. Our next item is our uh, meeting, every meeting update on the COVID-19 state of emergency. And I don't know if we've got any updates this week. I don't see Laurie out there. Uh, do you have any um, from your side, Jeff? Yeah, so um, one of the things that, that I wanted to talk about is reopening the town office building by appointment only. Um, we, we think we have a, a solid plan um, and, and it's not something that we haven't been doing as requested, but it hasn't necessarily been official when somebody needs to come in to see the treasurer collector or to see the clerk, um, we've been allowing them into the building and it, it would sort of be a, a formalization of, of what we've been doing um, where we ask people to call ahead for the, the relevant department that they wanna speak with, set up a time, um, the doors would remain locked, they would call when they get there and say, I'm here, we would come back, unlock the doors, um, they would complete the same uh, self-evaluation for symptoms that staff does every day and give their contact information so that could there be uh, somebody that's been in town, uh, the town office building that does test positive. We have that information available for contact tracing purposes. Um, and I think just try to, uh, to broadcast a little bit wider that, that this is something that's available. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, you know, the, I think the town clerk did a great job and was successful with the, the early voting and how that went in the town office building. Um, we do have the quarterly tax bills coming due. Um, and so we want to allow people who are looking for receipts and stuff to be able to come into the building. Uh, and then we're going to have early voting for for the national the presidential election coming up um, at the end of October as well, and so we just think that that this would be you know again we really haven't gotten um, any sort of complaints about the level of service that's been provided uh, since March when when we closed the doors, but I think that. Um, you know, the, the schools are reopening, the th things are starting to ease up. And so we want to slowly um, get back to, I guess, what, what will be the new normal. And I think that we feel like between the drop box, um, the, the counters that we've installed, the, the plexiglass, uh, the, the next, you know, we're in a good position to, to at least start opening up by appointment only. Um, so I don't know, I, I, said, I think I sent or uploaded a draft plan with all that information and I guess wanted to, we, and we did send it to the, the Board of Health who seemed to, to agree that by appointment only was, was a good way to start. Um, but wanted to see if there's any feedback from the select board, if you thought that that was a good idea, if you'd rather we go back and refine the plan or, or wait until we're just ready to unlock the doors and go back to business as usual. Um. Okay. <clears throat> um, do you have any, any uh, questions or comments, Tom or Scott? Uh, my, my biggest thing is, um, do we have a policy, have we established a policy 
um, about the people that can visit. So are you, are you ask are you asking a set of questions that they have to that that you, they have to um, answer before they come in the building, Jeff? Yes, it, it, it's the okay. same the same thing that employees do. Okay, um, if if one of if the someone comes in the building and then through contact tracing you learn that that person um had um was living with someone with a positive test and or was in close contact what happens then do you shut the entire town office building down and quarantine for 14 days or or what what is the policy in that regards oh. what would you do Hope that wasn't a no. Nope. Um, I, I think that what what we would do is we would certainly shut the building for a deep cleaning of the building, yep. um, and likely we would ask that that it, uh, people who were in contact with the person who it, I don't think if somebody was taught if somebody was tested positive who came into the building I think that we would then um, likely the person that they came in contact with would be tested as well. We would ask right. that they be tested and, and any other employees that felt like that would be a good thing before opening. I don't, we don't, yeah, I don't I, think we have a. I, I personally think, I think, I think that it, it's a good idea to open. Um, I just like to refine that policy before we get into that situation. So, no. so, have an understanding of what we're going to do. I, I like what you're saying so far about a deep cleaning, um, the, the COVID test, you know, is that going to be on the town's dime? Who's paying for that? But just refine that a little bit. I, I, I would be fine with that. Yeah. Cover I, all I, the I scenarios. Actually, I, I support, I, I, I support uh, your plan 100%. I would just take it that one extra step and try to do the what if, do, do the what if exercise. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a good step to full opening too. It's a nice gradual step in that direction. Agreed. Agreed, David. Yep. Yeah, it makes sense to have as many scenarios covered as we can. You never know. Um, one other thing which is tangentially COVID related is um, there's going to be a, a flu vaccine clinic um, at the Deerfield Highway Garage on October 4th. Um, and we put information up on our website. We put a news and announcement uh, call for volunteers. If there's anybody um, willing to help out on that day as a volunteer or that has medical experience, um, you can contact me, 665-1441 um, extension 9 or town admin at town of Sunderland.us and I can get the information over to the folks that are running that clinic and uh, it's going to be a drive-through. Um, people are asked to bring their insurance cards and the idea is that it's going to be uh, a bit of a dry run for when there is a, a COVID vaccine on how yep. regionally we would distribute that. Okay. So um, I guess just a reminder too to get your flu shots um, because it helps minimize, you know, both flu and COVID um, during the same season. So. All right, and I know a, a lot of public health officials are stressing too that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish between the regular flu symptomatically and COVID because of the overlap in symptoms. So the more uh, you can eliminate the flu as an issue, that would be very good. <clears throat> All right. Um, do you have any, anything else for our COVID update at all? I think that's no, we're working probably it. Right. Our, our reporting for the CARES Act, um, which is due September 25th. And I think we're in, we're in good shape right now. That's expenditures through June 30th. And then yeah. as soon as we get through that, we're probably going to be starting to submit for our initial FEMA reimbursement for COVID-related expenses. All right. Great. All right. Um, next up is a discussion of benchmark information. Do we have any new financial information from the state other than that one piece of the? 
the, the state assessments. Yeah, um, we we did get an updated estimates on the state assessments, which were, um, I would say, in in line with what we sort of budgeted. Um, I think we budgeted that we expected in our uh, budgeting exercise that it would be about two hundred thousand dollars, and it came in at about two hundred and five thousand dollars. So I think we were pretty spot on with that. Um, we're just waiting for a couple more big pieces. Um, school choice receiving, I think, is one of them, and then the state-owned property. I think are the the two sort of major pieces left, and and then we'll know what what state aid looks like okay. for this fiscal year. So inching closer. Yeah, and it's putting us in the because we were figuring October, November that we'd have a better picture. So, all right. Mr. Chair, could I suggest we jump down to 120 North Main as we have two people waiting? Yep, that's yes. Thank you. I was going to suggest that before we go to our updates. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about 120 North Main Street. And we have our guests, Laura and Gina there. How are you? Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. Um, I guess we'll introduce ourselves. I'm Laura Baker. Um, I'm an employee of Valley Community Development Corporation and we're acting as the project manager for the Sunderland Senior Pro Housing Project at 120 North Main Street. I'm Gina Gavoni, Executive Director of the Rural Development Inc., also the Franklin County Regional Housing Authority. Happy to be working with... I just, I'm happy to be working with Laura Baker who's going to walk you through uh, this evening's uh, presentation. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming. I had no idea you were awash in 40B projects here in <laughs> Sunderland. Man, oh man. We just have to fight them off. Yeah. Lucky folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the proximity to UMass. Ooh. Doesn't so, hurt. Um, it's the first I've heard about this new one. So, but I have walked through that old nursing home building. Okay. And it needs a fair amount of love <laughs> to be used again so i know that that's that's a polite description yeah. <laughs> so um jeff i don't know if you are going to share uh the materials that we sent i would suggest we start with the um topics sure. sheet mm -hmm. and then we're going to bounce to the timeline All right. Actually, why don't you just start with a timeline? Okay. It's easier. So one of our purposes in taking your time tonight is to give you some updates on the status of this development. Does anyone here need a background primer on what this project is? No. <laughs> <laughs> God, we're no. a little familiar with it, I think. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so we were um, thrilled, honestly, to, to get all the funding that is needed for this project awarded on the first application uh, in June. Um, and so wanted to walk you a little bit month by month with what we're doing. It, there's a lot of paperwork that goes between the time of award and the time of actually building anything. So um, we're now in September. Uh, we're completing, in fact, they're due today, 100% construction drawings. They're due to go out to general contractors tomorrow um, to give us a proposal and a price. And those prices will be due mid-October. Uh, we're lining up local funding uh, through Greenfield Savings Bank. We're working with the state on a variety of things to get ready. Um, and we will, I've already made contact with Steve Kroll, we'll, we'll kind of circle back to the Zoning Board of Appeals who has a final chance to review the plans now that they're complete, um, as well as having their peer review engineer take a look at them. Um, prices come in in October, wherein we immediately start value engineering the project. <laughs> I don't know if people are noticing that the construction climate has gone pretty haywire and prices are are escalating rapidly. So uh, we assume we'll have some work to do there. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to pull the numbers together, execute a, a contract with the general contractor. Um, and then there's more attorneys and paperwork that happens. It goes on for a god awful amount of months. And then we target actually closing and simultaneously at the same, at the same date, 
acquiring the property from the town, hopefully by March 1st, so we can kind of get a jump on construction, get in the ground early spring, and we're looking at, at about an 18 month build. Um, so that's our, that's our game plan. Um, any questions about that stuff? Great. So if we bump to the topics page, I'll just run through the other items that we're hoping to talk with you and just come once maybe. Do you see that? No, we're still on the You see the timeline. timeline. Let me see. Now we see the Brady Bunch. Yeah. <laughs> Hollywood Squares. <laughs> That's a better one. Yes. <laughs> now we don't have to sing. There it is. Who was the middle guy who was so funny? What was his name? I can't remember. Paul Lynn. Paul Lynn. Yep. There you go, Paul Lynn. We all date ourselves. So, yeah. um, so we talked a bit about the timeline. Um, one of the uh, conditions in the zoning decision that came from the ZBA was that the project have local preference, which is prescribed, both defined as to what it means and the amount of it that you can have by the State Department of Housing and Community Development. So it is up to the town to apply for this. Um, and we see our role as helping you to do that. Um, and so we're just kind of giving folks a heads up. We think the timing is right to go ahead and do this piece of homework that's kind of um, from the zoning decision. Um, and so maybe we'll run through these topics and then if people want to, we can look at a draft that I prepared. It's entirely up to you whether you wanna use it or edit it or whatever. It's just really for your convenience um, that you could use as a template to request local preference. Any questions about what local preference is? I'll start with that. Could you okay. remind us that local preference happens in the first round of yeah. advertising and it yeah. does not happen thereafter? Yeah, so it happens. We can't actually advertise it because right. we might discourage people from applying. But Got um, it. Sorry. In, in, Wrong that's, word. Okay. that's okay. In the initial lottery, um, it applies to the initial lottery, which then the results of that lottery become the initial wait list. So it's still a pretty powerful tool because we could get 100, 200 applications and those folks would be on the wait list. And senior housing is the kind of thing where sometimes people will wait a long time for it. Um, they'll apply and we might call in two or three years and they might still be interested because it's that kind of looking ahead to transition out of your home into an apartment. Um, so it is a great opportunity for Sunderland. It's Sunderland residents, municipal employees, employees of businesses in Sunderland and those who have children in the school system. So moving down. So one thing we just wanted to give a heads up about is, is it's tricky to line up the timing of the site acquisition exactly with the construction start. Um, because the closing is all about paperwork and legal things and construction is pretty much about weather <laughs> and people being ready to go. So um, in some cases, there might be an opportunity. Um, for example, if, clo if the closing process is delayed, but the GC is ready to go with um, temporary fencing and you know, mobilizing on the site and getting ready, we might come to the board and ask for a, a written agreement for access to the property um, to kind of get a jump on some of these things. And one other item is we, we have a settlement agreement with an abutter who's allowed to move some landscaping from the town's property. And again, we might come to you asking for you to sign off on access that will that allow her permission to hire someone to come and do that. So we don't need anything from you tonight on this, um, but I can kind of see that there's a good chance it'll come. Um, closings have a way of getting dragged out and we really don't want to miss the timing for replanting things or the timing for um, kind of getting the construction process underway. Oh, and we want to take the historic sign off the house now so it doesn't get lost. <laughs> and we want your permission for that. 
That's an easy one. You want yes. that emotion? Uh, do we motion. have a motion to um, allow them to take the historic sign off for future safekeeping and replacement? I'll second Tom's motion. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. All right. There you go. Thank you. We had one of these go walking, and I eventually oh. re reclaimed it. Someone had taken it because he said he was afraid someone would take it. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> So, there you go. It there seems go. so circular in logic. <laughs> it was yeah. really funny. <laughs> I'm going to so, take it so nobody takes it. I know. So um, permits, we wanted to talk about um, two types of permits. Um, obviously, we need a water connection um, permit as well, but we will be working directly with the water, the commissioners, the water commissioners for that. Um, we, we understand the sewer connection permit is probably within the purview of the select board itself and the building permit is within the purview of the building inspector. However, it wasn't entirely clear to me or to the building inspector when I spoke with him about really how to define our, our project in terms of the building permit cost. Um, and we didn't know whether the select board had the ability to waive either or both of these permits. Um, and really it's about, again, this escalating construction climate. So we're, we're pulling out all the stops, <laughs> trying to make sure that we can pay for the project. So the first ask on the building permit is, is, you know, do you have the authority to, or the interest or willingness to waive it? And if that's not feasible, um, there's a big difference um, in terms of the project being residential versus commercial. And I will tell you when we've pulled permits for other projects in other communities for multifamily construction, we have never paid anything close to 92,000. So I'm assuming that those communities are thinking of it as a residential type of project rather than commercial, but it is potentially subject to interpretation. So Laura, was the feedback from the building inspector it being potentially commercial because of zoning or because of the fact that it's third party operated? Yeah, the fact that it's it's a non-owner occupied right. rental, right. Um, but its character is residential. I mean, it's not, a, a, it's an R2 or R something use. I mean, it's not a commercial use. It's a res it's, it's all people living there. So under building code, it's definitely residential. You look at all the building code that relates to residential, um, but it's not owner occupied residential, which, you know, tends to be the norm um, in Sunderland, so. So I would ask the question if I could, Mr. Chair, maybe yeah. have Jeff in the form of homework, does the $15,500 residential classification cover the cost of the requisite inspections for okay. the individual inspectors? Because we're essentially, we're enterprise on many of those right now. I would like, I'd like to have that information before making a decision on this part. I'm leaning toward it, but not necessarily at a loss for people in those uh, enterprise funds. Hey, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Scott. Um, that that's probably just the building ins the that's yeah. just a building inspector. Yeah, I was thinking not. right. You've got the others, all the subordinate permits, right. right? And and so my my I if I I I'm I'm on wave I'm on the same wavelength as you are on that, and and sometimes when you have big projects like that, he calls in assistant help. Yep. You know. And I would just want to make sure that he would be able to cover those expenses. You know what I mean? I do. Get an item so, so, that, so I, I, I agree with you that, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I think we do have the authority to, to work with that fee and to work with him. I would question the, um, and, and again, our inspectional services are not supposed to be a money maker. We're supposed to cover our expenses. Correct. So I would ask him uh, get an honest appraisal on what it would cost to do the inspections and if you'd have to bring people in. And that's across across the disciplines. Oh uh, yeah, you could you could you could add that absolutely. Right, because you're gonna have you're gonna have plumbing, like electrical. electrical. Laura, is the ninety two thousand all encompassing or is that just the building permit? 
I think it's just the building permit. It, it yeah. looks that way when I look at the fee schedule yep. for the building permit itself. But again, I could be wrong. I, you know, we could we could do a little more research as well. But I think it's just the building permit. So if if I could, Mr. Chair, Jeff, um, uh, some homework with with uh, uh, Tom on the inspection side, Inspector Tom. Uh, that is, what was what would electrical plumbing building what's the total permit submission for the project as is designed currently and what latitude does the board have in making sure that we're covering our costs but also helping to contribute with uh effectively air quotes town contribution to the project sort of itemized invoice yeah, I mean, what does it look like? Again, there's 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 the straight retail side. And to Tom's point, you know, we we have a permit fee structure. If it goes sideways, any given project can take more time from an inspection perspective than needed. I, as as anybody in construction knows, on the application that happens, uh, it can happen on the inspection side as well. You know, something head sideways and 14 inspections later, it's finally corrected. Well, yeah, you didn't exactly cover your costs. That said, what would those costs look like? What's the bottom, what's the bottom of our costs based on what we see here? And I'd be interested in entertaining moving toward that cost versus straight off the fee schedule. Well, that seems to make sense. And ju just so I'm clear, you want that broken down by each type of inspection yeah, yeah. There's going to be an electrical permit, a building cost. permit, a plumbing yes. permit. There's going to be all kinds of permits. Total right. cost. All right. And then I know that you oversee the sewer connection, and I honestly, I'm, I apologize. I didn't look up what your fee is. You may know it already. It's a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> He's got his hat on already. It really yeah. is crazy because it, it's based on fixtures. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How many toilets and sinks have you got? Quite 32. a few. Quite a few, right. <laughs> is it really based on fixtures? Yes, it is. It is. Okay. So or we think any bidets you were thinking about. <laughs> might, might throw ourselves on yeah. your mercy there. <laughs> Um, this is one we had talked about informally before, and it just seems so premature to have a conversation about it without, you know, but now we're actually getting to where we're going to pull some of these permits. So we asked I, to think I, about I, it. On, on, on the sewer, Jeff, could, could you talk to uh, Rich Brenda and ask him if he, if he would envision any expenses that uh, the WWTP would have to uh, provide? And, and if, if there's not, I would... I would, you know, I would consider waiving that fee yep. personally. Thank you. I would agree. Will do. Thanks. Uh, the last uh, topic was that it, the way that the option agreement between RDI and the town is written, the town, of course, reserves the right to have an affordable housing deed restriction just would ask you to start thinking and talking maybe with town council about whether it's important to the town to hold its own um, separate deed restriction or whether you are content to go in as a joint signatory on a common affordable housing deed restriction with other funders. It's done both ways. It's really probably about how much time is spent with attorneys um, and if the if the acquisition of the property is simultaneous with the closing on the other funding sources, then there's also an opportunity to consolidate the affordable housing restriction. Sometimes those things don't happen at the same time or a town gives you money early and they, they want the deed restriction early to secure those uh, resources, but we can work with it either way. I just kind of, we're starting to plan some of these things. So we do I was going to say, Mr. Chair, if I could, yeah. in the construction timeline, this is something you'd want to have wrapped up pre-March. Yep. That would make sense early on. Yep. Okay. Yeah. As soon as we start closing calls, which we anticipate in December, um, 
a whole host of attorneys will be just trying to put all the documents in order and and this will come up as a question about what the town what does the town want <laughs> and you know hopefully you won't have to send an attorney to participate in these you know what could be 10 closing calls um so it may be just to think about whether you want to go rolled into a larger document or you want your town council to craft your own document okay uh, our takeaway from tonight okay and I think that's all we had to bring before you tonight. Um, very happy to field questions. Anybody has any? I'm all set. I know there's a lot of people that are very uh, impatiently waiting. Let's put it yeah. that. Yep. Good. Do they want to move in? <laughs> they, they very definitely want to move in, yeah. Yay, that's what we want to hear. That's, that's the end game of all of this. <laughs> Well, you, you know, there, there's people that have lived for, you know, are getting to that point in their, most people, and you know, you're, you're rural D, RDI, so you understand the rural yep, landscape. complexities, and they want to stay in their home as long as possible, and yep. some, and some are, are recognizing that it may be time, and now they're looking at this as a is a, a very, very viable option that they've never had before. So yeah, there is, there, nice is a, there is excitement. That's nice to hear. Thank you. Hopefully you'll Excited. have a quiet construction season. Right. Mm. So right. with regard to the um, preference letter, I'm going to have a quick review and then sure. then take action on that or send it off to council or do you think that's even needed I, I think it's the kind of thing that often falls to people like jeff to right <laughs> to no that's, that's what i was i was just headed there i was watching i was looking at the tables and i read the content and it's, it's, yeah. it's really wonderfully um, or or cool. working with the the cog um they're your other resource often with things like this. So what we had that you might not have at your fingertips is um, RDI had commissioned a market study for mm -hmm. this particular development in January of 2020. So it's not totally stale. And so I just lifted things that I thought it was, they actually did a regional market study. So they looked a bit at Sunderland and then they also looked at the, the study area was actually including surrounding towns, but we wanted to reverse engineer it because really the argument in this is to define and articulate and emphasize the particular needs in Sunderland. Um, I'm happy to run through it with you. It, it really just is hoping to give you a leg up, kind of getting ready to put this in. Um, the towns do it all different ways. DHCD doesn't have like a form that you use. So some people write long things, some people write short things. It's really up to you. Well, based on what I read, the quality of that information, and now hearing that it's January 2020 update, uh, I'm inclined to support that letter in its current form. I agree with Scott. Second. Yep. Okay. And I'll add a third to that. So. One last thing to do. Right. You do have to put it on your letterhead. <laughs> you have to sign it. What? Uh. <laughs> So um, I would ask Jeff, because I assume you'll get tasked with this, that when you send it in, can you just copy me on it as well so that I know that it's underway? Absolutely. Thank you. Lord, just, sorry. No, please, Jeff, go ahead. I, I, this is probably an end of the conversation thing, but I just, you know, looking at the timeline, wanted to keep in mind the fact that there is going to be a roadway project on North Main Street that's likely kicking off in the spring as well yep. um, that just got advertised so once shameless plug yeah well, but it, it, it's more about um, you know having lots coordination of, yeah, yeah and, and yep. you know different construction vehicles and access to the site yeah. um, you know, keep, keeping that in mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I know that there's going to be curb cuts that need to happen and those types of things. So, yeah. however, I can be helpful in in 
bridging that uh, or making those connections and those conversations happen so that both projects can be successful simultaneously. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's really good to know. So it's advertised now in the central register. Um, I, mass, I believe mass dot program. I believe so. Yeah, it's, it's a mass dot project. Okay. So, um, wow! Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, that was five years of life will never get back. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you think they're good to start in the spring? Is it a one season project? Do you think? I think so. It's it's um, basically from about. School Street, maybe, maybe the intersection yeah. of 116 to Claybrook. Yeah, no, I know so, where it is. Yeah, okay. uh, and, and they're, they're expecting to get done, you know, mill and, and pave and put the sidewalks in and everything yeah. in one season. Okay. Wow, what are the chances, huh? After so many years, <laughs> yeah. both we were fighting each other for access <laughs> dump trucks. Going on at once. Yeah, we need a wee bit of fill to come onto our side, so. <laughs> ah. All right, well, that is excellent to know that that's going on, because I can, I know that will require a lot of con um, coordination with the contractors. I feel it coming. Um, Jeff, if you want the market study that the, the data was drawn from for that local preference letter, um, I thought that might be useful for you to have as well. Just Absolutely. Please. Thank you. You do love data here. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for all that you do uh, and have done in the project, uh, Laura. And Gina, keep an eye at her, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you very really much. I appreciate your time, your time and everything and effort tonight. Thank you. All right. Have a Take great care, night. Everybody. Bye. Mr. Chair, if I could circle back to benchmarks for employee wages. Yep. Um, I understand Jeff raised the point about assessments coming uh, in line, a little elevated, but in line, and that's a good thing. Uh, there was a report from State House News today about how the expense pressure on the state funded healthcare program is act surprisingly down a little bit, uh, but not proportionate to what they're seeing with uh, revenues uh, being down, lost revenues from sales as well as uh, capital gains. Uh, also not nearly enough to offset loss in the other two uh, gaming and uh, cannabis. So that was today's capital news, okay. state house news, excuse me, state house news. What other tidbits come in? Yeah, it's and it was it was a. I, if I could continue, yeah. it was fascinating because no one in the budgeting process, estimating process, had thought that actual health care expenses would actually be down, but they're more than offset by unemployment by factors, not just by pennies. Yeah, yeah, because we got basically the entire service economy took a massive hit. So the Massachusetts has a 16% unemployment rate right now. And it's yep. the highest in the nation. Yep. Well, we've got select board updates next. Any any updates other than the uh, North Main? I will be going into executive session tonight to talk about the police contract, uh, update the board on the police contract current status. And uh, if the board is of that mindset, we may be in a position to um, work toward a signatory. And that would be over the next couple of weeks. Great. All right. How's it going there, Jeff? Any updates from you? Um, sure, just two quick things. Um, Seeing Gina reminded me to put a plug in for um, anybody who's having trouble for uh, paying rent because okay. of COVID right. issues. Assistance. There is uh, emergency rental assistance that RDI is doing that was CPA funded. Um, we recently asked FCAT and they were gracious enough to, to post a 
advertisement for it to help spread the word. Um, and on a related note, we did outreach to the apartment complexes um, and also posted to FCAT. Thank you to FCAT for doing it. Um, you know, just some tips about staying safe and social distancing and maximum group sizes and cleaning surfaces and hand washing and wearing masks. Um, we also, this might be more of a COVID update that I forgot, but we did put the, um, the variable message sign out on 116. You can see it coming oh. north from Amherst. That's it every morning. Um, so it's, you know, try, trying to stay on top of that, even though, you know, things have seemed to somewhat be returning to normal, uh, you know, and I think that you all have made this point over and over again, we have to stay vigilant where there is no vaccine yet. Um, and, you know, just trying to stay on top of it and, and remind people that uh, it's still out there and um, people are still catching it and, and unfortunately passing from it. So, yes. Yeah. Excellent points. Thanks. <clears throat> All right. Next up, I see George down at the bottom of my row of people there. Thanks for waiting, George. No problem. Appreciate it. You lost your tree background. That's too bad. It was nice. <laughs> <laughs> I had to move. Yeah. Getting a little dark out there, huh? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so we've got uh, sort of connected to you, too, in a way. We've got the diesel and fuel bid recommendation, uh, Jeff. Yes. Yeah, George, you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, this year we got uh, recommendations or bids for uh, diesel fuel. I think we have a fixed rate, but I think gasoline, nobody came in at a, at a fixed rate, so we have to go with a variable yep. for the gasoline price. Um, I think Karis Oil, I think, has the bid for the diesel, and Sandry has a bid for the gasoline. Yep, I think so, yep. Right. And are they equal to last year in the volume ask, or is the volume ask increased? Uh, no, volume's about the same. Same, okay. And the prices came in equal to uh, or less than? I think the diesel price came in a little bit less, and the, the gas is going to be the variable, so that would be questionable. Uh, yeah. we, we get a delivery, so. Yeah, because it is down. It's go by the rack prices down in Springfield at the time, plus plus a percentage on it, I guess. Yeah. 40 something or something around there, I thought I saw. Yeah, something like that. I think it's yeah. 40 cents or something, the yeah. tax plus a markup. Yeah. George, when you look at the prices, are they more or less than what you can buy at the pump right now? Um, I, the diesel's less right now. The gas, the gas, I won't know until I order it, what, what we get for a rack price. Um, so that's, that's the hard part about doing a variable. Nobody's seen, like the person that usually gives us, gives us a fixed rate on gasoline is, is uh, Dennis K. Burke. And they yep. didn't bid this year for some reason. <laughs> so, so could, can, so then are we going, instead of just ordering, we're going to, we're going to monitor the, the cost of the gas and, and if it if it does if mm. gas is consistently lower, we would uh, we'd buy at the pump, right? Well, we don't have anything to buy at the pump right so now. How, how do we get away from minimums as well? What's the minimum? I think, I think our minimum is a suggested minimum. I'm not sure if it's written up that way or not, or they if they hold us to that minimum or not. I would check into it, Scott. I, I, I just think that I, I would I would have Jeff I would have Jeff uh, look into working with the town accountant doing um, credit over at um, one of the st you know the station in town or outside of, you know Irving up on uh, Whiteley there. Um, I, I would I would I would try to I would try to minimize you know and again we've done this and we've done this in the past so i i think that's it's something that we should we should continue to monitor a lot of the times if you buy it from the rack price in in good years you can a lot of times get it cheaper than what you can at the pump 
because you're kind of buying it what like the big delivery companies buy it for right and they're charging you just a, a small premium on top of it. Yeah. yeah yeah it's, it's, it's like a half step back from retail just enough to keep it interesting yeah yeah, yeah i've got you know we use we use certain cards and you have to hit certain volumes to get certain discounts and anyway they know when you're coming they know when you're going yep yes they do don't they Scott? yes they do do you need a motion jeff at all a, a move that. to accept the fuel bids as recommended all right we have a second second all right all those in favor aye aye all right and then our last one uh, we've got a highway labor driver recommendation george right george is this seasonal or is this turnover this is full time full time yep and did we lose somebody or are we adding somebody we lost somebody okay motion we have a second on that I'll second. All those in favor of the recommendation for highway driver labor, George? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks. Thanks, George. Thanks One so other much, George. thing. So I've been doing some stuff on that Chapter 90 uh, possible truck purchase uh, oh, yeah. that we talked about recently, a while back. Um, I was able to get in touch with Daryl, and he said that we could do a purchase like that through Chapter 90. If you guys are still interested in that to replace the truck that we have right now, that's out of commission. Um, I've been looking at a few trucks. Some of the trucks that I originally saw in the beginning, those are trucks have long gone. They're selling trucks like hotcakes right now, especially some of the cheaper ones. Um, I found one, one right now, and I still got two more bids to send out or two more, uh, um, two more uh, truck information to send out to do two different companies to see if they have any trucks like this one that we're looking for. Um, I'm trying to keep it under that $50,000 mark. Um, one truck that I did find is like 2014. It's got very low miles on it. It's in really good shape still. Um, a truck like that, I think we could probably run for eight or 10 years without having to replace it. Um, I know this year coming up, I am putting in for a new truck because that's was kind of like the mark to replace our one of our freight liners. I was supposed to keep the truck that we are getting rid of now, but the frame subframe broke on it. Uh, um, so our Western Star got paid for, so now we were in the process to bid out one for next year, if possible, um, for the another five year, five to seven year lease that we did. Um, but I think this truck would fit well within the parameters and, and stay in service for at least eight to 10 years or, or maybe even longer if we replace the next truck. Cause originally I want to replace the, the, the freight liner um, cause that truck's cost us the most money in the last 10 years here. Yeah. I was going to keep the one that the subframe broke, broke on and keep that one for another five years until this one got paid for but that kind of changed since this truck broke on us. Um, so that's where we are with that. Um, right now, I think the truck, we had some old equipment that we could get rid of and trade in. The guy would take the truck, a sander and our plow, plus all the whacker or the holder, uh, the two junk holders that we have and then the attachments. He was yep. gonna give us 10 grand towards a trade in for it. Hmm. So, um, it would save us at least 10 grand on the truck, bring it down to like 49 grand on the one I've got back so far. So I don't know how you guys feel about that. What's the balance of chapter 90 or, or we can, we can figure this out between now and our next meeting. Yeah. yeah. Right. Chapter nine, the, the, cause I have a couple jobs that are still open that have money in it. Yep. I was going to take it out of one of those jobs and put it on and what not implemented on one of those jobs so the money would come out of that that's the money's already been allocated mm -hmm. so it's not in the it's not in the um the uh reservoir the re yep. reserve uh, yep. of the money that's in there i think that right now i have two hundred and fourteen thousand 
put aside for like Old Amherst and a couple other roads. But Old Amherst Road is on hold because we had some sewer issues that we were not mm -hmm. sure if one of the catch basins or the, the manholes is sinking. So mm -hmm. we're still in the process of trying to figure that out. So that's on hold. So we, we, we probably have with the money that we have all together, uh, about 300,000 in, okay. in the community. <clears throat> okay. Plus Jeffrey. the new stuff they allocated, so. Jeff, can we get uh, the last of the data collected of between now and our next meeting? Uh, on, on the bids or on yeah. the, the on, on, on the bids and available funds and trade-ins and kind of put it in a table form so we can take a look at it and go, okay, this makes sense. This doesn't make sense. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I have reservations about spending chapter 90 on capital equipment. I, George, no offense. No, I, I usually the same way. I don't want to spend money out of it, but I right. know I know we talked about it before, and yep. a couple of yep. you guys mentioned it. So that, yep. I'm just bringing it to you. And, and I appreciate that. I really, really do because necessity dictates. When you get to winter and you don't have two trucks, and you need uh, two trucks, right. you know, yeah, uh, that's a big deal. Uh, we start incurring other kinds of costs. The other aspect is uh, Chapter 90 and a board vote or a board signature of the chair. Uh, also uh, does a bit of an, this is just me speaking, does a bit of an end around around town meeting. And I'm, I'm hesitant to do that. We want to make sure that we can explain to town meeting why in the, at our next town meeting. So anyway, that, that, those are just, they, they, those rolled right into my head as if I understand the need uh, and right. I understand the mechanism that's available, uh, but also the, the kind of rules of engagement uh, are such that you know purchasing fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment under executive order because that's cool these days from Washington down is not my favorite idea. I think we're still an a open town meeting form of government, and that kind of appropriation should come from them. Yep. That said, in an emergency, and it sounds like we're getting close to it. We I, are. Yes. I I yeah. totally understand the ask. I totally do. I mean, I'd hate I'd hate to rent a truck like we did a lot. You know, when I first right. started, it's like here. four or five years ago, right? Yeah. Patterson Patterson made out really well that year. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thinking too. Look at the calendar before you know it. It's going to be you know plowing it's, season again. Too. It's 34 tonight. Is it really? Is that the low it's supposed to be? Yeah, that's the low. So it'll be here before you know it. Right. Sorry. That no, all good points. So okay. George, I, I'd recommend that you come together. You know, have a, have a recommendation next week for us. Okay. Yep. I'm. I'm I'm sending out some uh, other stuff tomorrow, so I'll hopefully I'm gonna I'm gonna tell them I need everything back by Monday morning by ten o'clock, and we'll see what we get by then. And then I'll have all the I'll have all the totals for the chapter ninety that we have left in there and uh, all that stuff for you guys. All right, awesome. Thanks, George. Thanks, George. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, I think that's uh, unless you get anything else. I know any public comments that. Uh, takes us to the end of our regularly scheduled programming here for tonight. And our last item will be, we'll be going uh, pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Paragraph 3, we'll be going out into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body, as Scott mentioned, we'll be talking about the police contract. Um, so we'll be uh, making motions to go into executive session and then we'll end our Zoom and then we will come back to adjourn only in public session. Anybody have any um, public Roll comments? Call. I'm sorry, was that Tom? Roll call. Yep. No, I just want to make sure that we didn't have any public comments at all left or anything. All right, feel good? All right. So roll call to go into executive session. Actually, first a motion. So moved. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Roll, Roll call. call. Aye. 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 All right. So we will be coming back only to, we will be Zooming. We'll be back just to adjourn for the evening. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks, George.